This week, we welcome David Sherry and Tara Schaffler from Princeton University to discuss their InfoSec World 2020 presentation, Making Security Programmatic and Cultural. In the Leadership and Communications section, why 67% of companies fear they can't sustain privacy compliance, how using an old school paper planner changed my life, or in my case, runs my life, how to attract top talent in a competitive hiring market, and more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Week. Cybersecurity isn't only about stopping the threats you see, it's about stopping the ones you can't see. That's why Microsoft Security employs over 3,500 cybercrime experts and uses AI to help anticipate, identify, and eliminate threats. So you can focus on growing your business and Microsoft Security can focus on protecting it. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash Microsoft Security. With over half of enterprise security budgets going towards detection and response in 2020, the challenge is investing in solutions that can scale, migrate, and adapt with your business. Cloud-native security solutions from ExtraHop are purpose-built to help your team respond to threats across the hybrid attack surface. Everywhere your enterprise exists today and wherever it goes tomorrow, ExtraHop is there to secure it. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 163, recorded February 17th, 2020. I am your host, Matt Alderman, here in Colorado, waiting yet another snowstorm. It's also President's Day, which means both Paul and Jason are out. That means I have a new co-host for this one joining me remotely, is the original host of this show, Mr. Michael Santarcangelo. It's like what's old is new again. It's uh, it's always delightful to be here with you, Matt. I'm glad you could fill in for me this week. I was out last week, so this is kind of repay, I think, for, for me being out. And anyways, I, I, I ended up on the better side of the deal. I got you for a co-host. I appreciate that. <laughs> Join us at InfoSec World 2020, March 30th to April 1st at the Disney Contemporary Resort. Security Weekly listeners save 15% off the InfoSec World Main Conference or World Pass. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ISW2020. Click the register link to get our discount code. Click the book link uh, to schedule your micro interview as we will be recording down there as well. And also, Paul and I are hosting the Container Security Summit on that Saturday, March 28th. Before the conference begins, if you're interested in speaking or joining a panel discussion, please email either Paul or me. All right, this is an InfoSec speaker uh, interview. So David Sherry serves as the Chief Information Security Officer for Princeton University. He leads the Information Security Office, which has responsibility for security architecture, engineering, operations, risk assessment, compliance, business continuity, business continuity disaster recovery, and awareness and training. Tara Schaffler is the Information Security Awareness and Training Program Manager at Princeton University. Tara has over has been at Princeton for over 15 years, spent the last eight focusing on training and technical communications, and over the past three and a half years, she has built a robust security awareness and training program from the ground up. David and Tara, welcome to Business Security Weekly. Thank you. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks. <laughs> Glad to be here. All right. So uh, what I want to start, this is going to be a presentation that you're going to do at InfoSec World. At the end, we'll, we'll kind of let people know when you're speaking. So if they're at InfoSec World, they can come check you out. But you have a pretty unique story at Princeton University, where for a long time, you didn't have a security program at all, like into 2016. Uh, and then I think, David, you came over to start. Give us a little of the history of the security program at Princeton, kind of when you went over and kind of walk us through kind of a high level of, of the, the approach you took there, because it's pretty unique. Okay, thanks. So uh, let me set the record straight that up until 2016, Princeton mm -hmm. was not a vast wasteland of security. They were doing IT security with excellence from architecture to design to monitoring to even deprecation. 
but they really did it as a distributed area throughout the IT group and never really had a focus on what it meant to be a world-class security program. There was a CISO that was here for a short time before I was fortunate enough to come here, and uh, she had to leave for personal reasons. So I came down Route 295, I mean, Route 95, about 280 <laughs> miles from Providence to central New Jersey and joined the Princeton staff in 2016. And at the time, it all started with a vision that was shared between the CIO and myself to make security programmatic and cultural throughout the university. So programmatic that it was plugged into everything from hiring someone to getting a new copy machine to uh, uh, assessing a new risk for a new hosting provider and making it cultural that everybody understood security was part of their role, that the security office were the experts, but everybody had to maintain a security posture in order for us to be successful. So we put this team together uh, in October of 2016. Um, no operational responsibilities whatsoever. I always say, woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> um, as a CISO and having no responsibility, we had forensics and incident response, and hopefully you didn't have to use that too well. Mm -hmm. But it was our job to make sure that security became cultural, that people knew that it was part of their job, that we gained influence, that we gained mm -hmm. trust, that we created the partnerships, that we under uh, get to the point where everyone understood what our role was and what their role was before we started doing traditional information security posture like security operations. A little bit unique. Um, I think we accomplished it faster than most people yeah. thought we could do it. And um, we really started to make uh, an impact on this campus. Yeah. So now we're, you're about, what, three and a half years into the program now. I think mm -hmm. you yep. said earlier that now you're going to start to take on some operational responsibilities. And our first question was why? <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it's the right thing to do, Johnny. I mean, uh, every security guy loves to have threat hunting and incident response and all the dashboards and having their phone go off in the middle of the night. That's, that's what we live for, right? Um, no, I really think because of the reputation we built, because of the success that we had, three years of unqualified success, um, best in class risk assessment, uh, best in class training and awareness program that's getting just all sorts of publicity nationwide in higher ed. The next step was to do make a best in class world class operations for security operations where my, it was under my authority with my associate chief information security officer and a terrific manager of engineering and operations to do advanced threat hunting, do incident response, uh, get the right tools in place, and just show that we, once again, can increase security and reduce risk throughout the university with the actions that we're taking. The time was right. Uh, we're really excited about it. I think we're ahead of where I expected us to be about six to eight months into it. And, you know, maybe in a year or so, we can come back on and tell you the success we're having in that area as well. Yeah, and it took you, like you said, three years of success building trust. And so that's mm -hmm. where I want to dig in a little bit, because Tara, I think this is a lot of what you've been doing over the past mm -hmm. three and a half years is is starting to build that, you know, the programmatic side, but also changing the culture and the awareness and a lot of the other things. So kind of walk us through the approach that you started with the three over three years ago, and, and we'll kind of dig into kind of the steps you took along that journey. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I came over. I had been at Princeton, as you know, for um, at that time about 12 years. And I, I came over to the information security office and realized that, wow, we um, we have a lot of work to do. Yes. And so one of the first things we did was make sure that we revamped our website, that we really built our resources, made those all available. Then we really just tried to figure out the lay of the land. And I think knowing what you are really dealing with and you're and figuring out your communication channels is number one. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about that in our presentation. It's really about knowing your audience mm -hmm. and being able to then effectively communicate to your audience. Mm -hmm. So figuring all of that out, figuring out the lay of the land, and then really just getting out there. So we mm -hmm. did not hesitate. We did plan, but then we were out there within three months of the creation of our office mm -hmm. and out there doing trainings, visiting departments, and um, trying to piggyback on any events that we could mm -hmm. really uh, get into at the university mm -hmm. and just making people aware of who we were right. 
and what services we offered. And then again, really just opening their eyes to mm -hmm. the threats that we are uh, actually experiencing here. Yep. Branding, laptop Branding. stickers, <laughs> yeah. uh, campus-wide mailing for the solution that Tower built called the Fishbowl. So within three or four months, people knew who we were, mm -hmm. what we stood for, and could identify us by our logo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting. You didn't have security operational responsibilities. So what were some of those things that people would contact you for in the early days as part of that communication and start building that trust with the new security office? Yeah, so I know one of the things um, is uh, with our data classifications here at Princeton, I know we get a lot of questions about that. People get a little bit tripped up with that information. Mm -hmm. Uh, even just general, just um, information security best practices, we got called out to several departments just to be able to report out on that and really help train folks. Sure. Yeah. Risk assessment was a big one uh, to come in. We we actually did, a, uh, not a campus-wide, but a majority of the campus, we did a full-blown risk assessment to a uh, look at their data, their access, mm -hmm. their machines, their support, contracts, uh, hosting facilities. So that that was a big one. Some um, scanning. Some consulting for research data, uh, yep, too. Yep. For research data projects, we started acting as a consultant for best practices in that storage and to maintain uh, the security and the privacy of the information they were collecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of questions about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mike, I want to give Michael a chance to get in here because I know he's got a lot of questions, too. I don't want to monopolize the whole interview. Hey, you know what? You're you're so good at it, Matt. It makes it easy. But l let's go back to it for a second because we talked a little beforehand too. One of the things I think is fascinating about higher ed in particular is that the challenges, the struggles you have to deal with are exceptionally diverse. You've got a huge population and it's I think you've said it's a little bit like running a small city. That largely means you have to influence without direct authority. So let's go back for a second. As you're reaching out, your first three months in, a lot of folks in the CISO position today are struggling with that. They'll say, well, I want to reach out to the business. I want to, I want to connect. I want to let them know I'm here. You guys were super mm -hmm. successful at it quickly. What advice would you have to somebody listening? H how do they reach out? What are, what are some of the things that you did or said that worked well that you think somebody who's not in higher ed might be able to leverage for their success too? Yeah. So in higher ed, we have a saying, relationships are currency. Mm -hmm. And without those relationships, uh, having a cup of coffee, a handshake on the way out after a business meeting, it would be hard to get your mission and your strategy across. When I came down 95, uh, I had to make sure that I wasn't the outsider with the Boston accent that no one wanted to talk to. So my first 40 days of working, my first 40 working days, I had 92 meet and greets mm -hmm. with uh, everyone that the CIO wanted me to meet with, the provost wanted me to meet with. Uh, after I would stop meeting with people, they'd say, oh, you have to talk to so-and-so. So I automatically had 92 people in the first two months mm -hmm. that I could reach out to and call upon. The interesting thing was every one of them had a story. <laughs> Uh, whether it was a complaint about the help desk or a complaint about uh, central IT or security or the uh, Xfinity or <laughs> Fios, it didn't really matter. <laughs> Everybody had some kind of uh, story. And I could either walk them through a solution or I would often go back and talk to the right people in uh, OIT or research it myself throughout the night and come back with a solution to them. So I started making those connections that we were people that we could rely upon. And I started laying out my vision and I would get feedback on that. And a lot of those people actually I used as reviewers of my first three year strategic plan. And they really appreciated the opportunity to comment on the thoughts they were having. So the relationship started really early, really quick, pick some low hanging fruit, establish a good connection, get them involved by reading some of my papers right off the bat. And uh, that has continued and actually has expanded quite a bit. Yeah. I was going to say, one of the things I love to do is kill them with logic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. It's all about education and mm -hmm. people really recognizing that the threat is real, that mm -hmm. we are a target here in higher ed, and that we all need to play a part in trying to protect our own information, the information that we steward for the university. Mm -hmm. So those are all things that I think were, was really, it was really important for us to get that message out. Mm -hmm. The other thing is we really try to market ourselves as a customer service driven department. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we really try to extend our hand, 
not be the department of no, right, David? Not the department of no. <laughs> we want to be able to help people do their jobs, but do it securely. Mm. So absolutely, those are things that we really try to push out there because I think there's an old school kind of mentality of the information security office that yeah. we are just, you can't do that, mm -hmm. you know? So we're, we're really trying to be very customer service focused. Yeah, it's actually almost in my job description that I can't say no to a good idea, <laughs> for instance. Um, I have to say, that's a great idea. Let me help you to securely enable that data or securely enable that project so that Princeton's reputation stays stellar. We, I can't tell a faculty or a researcher or an undergrad who could possibly change the world 20 years from now. I can't tell them no, because it's not the right thing to do. We just have to figure out the most secure way of handling it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well what I think is interesting is you take, you embrace a concept we have on the show, problem solution value. And you actually applied it is in these meetings, right? You were out talking to the different constituents across the university, understanding some of their problems. You looked at ways yeah. to solve those problems, that, that low-hanging fruit, as you talk about. That drove value for them, but it also built a level of trust that they could bring a problem to you. You would look for a, a solution that would work, thus creating that trust in the organization that you needed to establish to continue your success. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, right. I think it goes a really long way. Yeah. Yeah. And we are actually having success in areas that traditionally might not have had success, like computer science and applied math and astrophysics that have some really smart people and great IT teams. They're reaching out to us, looking for our expertise and our partnership to get some of their projects done, which is really exciting. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, Michael, I know you've got more. Yeah, I, I've actually got two based on some stuff you guys shared. Let's uh, let me see. Let's do this order. So, Tara, when you guys were reaching out to people, or maybe this is for both of you, did you encounter the, okay, that all sounds great, guys, but security owns that. I, I've got a job to do. It's not security. How do you start helping people understand that they can play a role in it, even though they may not own it? Or did you not encounter that? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, David, do you have, did you encounter that much? So I think, Mike, that's uh, certainly something that you have to fight no matter what organization you are in business, banking, uh, healthcare, insurance, whatever, it's, yeah, that's security's job. The interesting thing is, you know, in higher ed, it's very decentralized, or can mm. be very decentralized as well. So you don't get too many pockets of that. I haven't had it yeah. too much. I, I'm thinking, really, I'm like, yeah. I have a good example for you. They I, don't want to have to think about their endpoint protection, or they don't want to think about their passive scanning agent or other things that we throw on the desktop. They do want security to just take care of that. But they recognize that in an age when you've got phishing mm. hitting your inbox and you've got phone calls coming over your desk that looks like it's coming from Princeton that they say they're from Microsoft support, it's not just uh, it's not just the security department. Everybody has to play a role in yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. We, we've had pretty good adoption with that kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. It seems like people really do recognize that it's a different environment now mm -hmm. and that we all really have to kind of watch out and right. be, you know, be vigilant. Follow-up question, possibly related, because you're having really good success now with people reaching out to you. One of the things a lot of the CISOs I work with struggle with is they don't have enough time. There's too many meetings. There's too many opportunities for coffee and follow-up and that they are in demand and they feel like they can't say no or maybe they shouldn't say no, can't say no. But there's only so much capacity. How do you handle that? How do you how do you handle, yes, I love that idea. Let me help you do it securely with the fixed resources and, and the time and the energy of the team that you have and the projects that you're trying to get accomplished. Right. So first of all, Mike, I say bring it because I don't want to turn <laughs> people away. Um, we just deal with it as best we can. If it means additional staff or what have you, I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. We all have too much work. I've got a tremendous staff that goes above and beyond uh, to satisfy customers, to get their work done. We think as a team, we act as a team. If you know I'm off for a day, I can rely on my associate CISO and Tara to step right up and, and jump into whatever is necessary. We have um, a request line that comes in. It goes to the entire team. Tara does the triage on it, but whoever has the expertise jumps in. Mm -hmm. um, I, it, the time demands are never going to go away. We can say, all right, we're going to work nine hours a day and then we need 10 and we're going to work 10 hours a day and we need 11 and we're, now we're going to work on Saturday. So we just have to manage it appropriately. Um, the one thing about higher ed is people are forgiving when you let them know what's going on. 
hey, great idea. We've got a little bit of some projects that we have to finish. We'll get back mm-hmm. to you in two weeks. They accept that. Um, if they need something quicker, we address our, you know, our calendars as yeah. well. Um, perfect example of this is we have this great process called the architecture and security review that we implemented. This is a proactive risk assessment that not is just architecture and security anymore. It covers privacy, firewalls, contracts, user experience, uh, audit and compliance, internal audit, all sitting around the table, talking with the business owner, the data owner, and the vendor and doing an assessment using you know world-class tools to come up with mm-hmm. the risks to the university. Demand is outpacing supply. Um, we try to do this every Wednesday. It's only February 17th. We've already done 20 this year. I think we have 33 <laughs> scheduled through the end of March. We just have to start finding the time to do this. This is one of the greatest risk reductions that the yeah. university has, and the community is just embracing it and wants our expertise. I know, I love that. Yeah, we can't we can't say we don't have enough time. We have to we have to tell them we we're scheduled now until yeah. April, and they have to accept that. But uh, um, we just we just get it done. I mean, time demands are hard for everybody. We say bring it. <laughs> yeah. So so two follow ups, Tara. You do the triage. What are some of the things that you look at? Or give us some insights to how you triage this and set expectations with the person making their quest as well as with your with your colleagues and your team. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I make sure that um, I try to be pretty timely with things, look at them immediately, try to, um, you know, reach out to whoever I feel has the expertise to, to work on it so that they have plenty of time to jump right on it. There's a lot of things that I have to say, um, you know, I don't believe in recreating the wheel. So mm-hmm. if I if I know that that's a standard answer, that's something that we've talked about many times, even if it's somebody else's expertise, I can jump in and take care of it, I will. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the things is if you can just get it, get turn it around really quick, that's fantastic. There are other times that things tend to be a little bit more technical or they're kind of one off situations Mm -hmm. and they're a little bit more tedious. And I know that I'm going to have to talk to David or I'm going to have to talk to our our associate CISO. Mm -hmm. And that way, I I think really the best thing is, like David said, is to be able to get back to the customer right away and say, listen, this is going to take a little bit more time. This Mm -hmm. is something that we want to look at really carefully and let them know that that we are working on it and that we just want to come up with the best solution for them and make sure that it is a well thought out Mm -hmm. solution and that we do make sure that Mm -hmm. we're not duplicating efforts on anything and make sure that we're delivering the right answer. Mm -hmm. So I think when people understand, again, kill them with logic, right? So make sure that they understand maybe what we're dealing with on our side, if it's going to take a little bit longer uh, and uh, you know, or if we we've got other things kind of, in front of them that just have to be taken care of. Most people are pretty good about it. And yeah. if it escalates and if they need something else sooner, they're usually mm-hmm. good about pushing back and saying, listen, mm-hmm. this is a really big deal. And then we just have to adjust. Yeah. Princeton is a delightful place to work. Uh, everybody is focused on Princeton excellence and understands time demands and everybody wants to do the right thing for Princeton to yeah. keep our reputation up. So That's as long great. as they get an email back and say, Hey, we're working on this or here's the way we're going to do it. Um, it, it usually goes a long way. Tara is an expert at assessing cultural impacts of some of the things that come in. So thank you. We um, we look at the big picture a lot as to how this is going to this one question could impact the university overall if it got a little bit larger. And we try to address sure. that up front yeah, as well. Yeah, definitely. That is very important mm-hmm. to look at the big picture. Right. And, and what I extracted out of that is just the open communication channel, right? The ability to let people know where where you are in the process having the ability to have that dialogue back and forth it's a standard communication principles right if everybody knows what's going on then then people not won't necessarily get upset right they may not they may want it faster and there may be reasons why but if you're having that open communication it makes the job a lot easier yeah. It really does. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's one of the things that I focus very much on. And I actually talk about it in our session as well, uh, is about writing clear and concise communications, mm-hmm. because, I mean, that is super important, really all over the, <laughs> the university. But specifically with what we do, especially since things can get very um, technical, mm-hmm. there could be a lot of technical jargon and being able to just take that information and be able to put it into language that everybody understands mm. and pushing information out to people in a, in a way that they can, they can easily digest. Right. And so we talk about that as well, because 
Nobody has time, right? Mm-hmm. I don't have, yeah. we don't have time, David, nope. right? People don't have time. So <laughs> we want to make it as, as painless as possible for people, without a doubt. Definitely keep the pain level low. In, internally in my group, we use an old quote by uh, football coach Don Shula. We strive for perfection, but we settle for excellence. We don't go anything less than the excellence bar. And even with our communication, they really are so for, focused. Yeah. They are so easy to read. They're done with great graphics. And, and, it uh, frustrates people otherwise. Yeah. And it, we recognize that, the, I mean, we love information security because mm-hmm. we're in information security. Yeah. We, we mm-hmm. This is what we do. Yeah. Uh, but most people, this is not really at the, mm-hmm. it's not, they don't get up and think about it right away like we do. We, but <laughs> we also make it memorable by making it fun. Uh, we try. Tara has the cyber wheel of fortune. We set up a table outside of what's known <laughs> as flu fest when 6,000 people are going in to get their flu shot and they have to walk by our table. They want to spin, spin the wheel and answer a question and win a prize. And we actually had a complaint from the people who were running flu fest that there were too many people around the security office table and they were stopping the flow of traffic. So I'll take that. I'll take that complaint anytime. That's, true. That's a great compliment. That a fun day. So Tara, so, so tell me this and did you do the, the ability to communicate before you got onto security or is that something you've learned yeah. since you've been in security? It's something that um, in my prior position here at the university, I got really involved in training and writing a lot of technical communications. And as I started writing those technical communications and also working as a SharePoint administrator, I was I was tasked with putting together a lot of different um, events and training. And, and I wound up, I realized again, that people are so busy and that you want to make sure that things are really clear. And so I, over the last, I mean, probably eight or nine years, I've really been focused on, again, those t- writing those technical communications and putting it in, a, in la- a language that's really easier for the, the average yeah. folks. And then also just, just clear even email communications mm-hmm. going out because it has so many people getting confused about different things. And then I wound up becoming kind of the, the, the go-to person mm-hmm. in my old job even to mm-hmm. say, hey, we want to read this and, yeah. and clean this up and make it. And people really appreciate when they can just look at something quickly because, again, nobody has time, mm-hmm. understand it, and move on. Mm-hmm. I posted the job description for the training and awareness person and it almost didn't have the word security in it. Uh, I just needed somebody with creativity, excitement, yep. great communication skills, branding, marketing, website design, all of those things. Yeah. And uh, Tara comes along. She was actually concerned about putting in for the job anyway, knowing it was a security job, but we I can did. teach her the security. And now she is in demand on our campus for communication stand, uh, excellence. And she's also on, in demand <laughs> nationwide in higher ed for what the program that she's put together. So I hired for the right skills and not for the security jobs. Yeah. Now you have yeah and I just job. want to take a second yeah. and compliment you on that, Tara, because that's a really rare skill set. And David, what a great Thank job to, th- to think that way and to look for that and to recognize that because we see a lot of people <laughs> in security. This is where they struggle and they don't necessarily think that they can hire somebody who doesn't have that big security background. But Tara, as you pointed, because right. you've said a couple of times now, as we in security think. So uh, congratulations. We've thoroughly converted you and you're, you're part of it yeah. now. And, and that's great. Yeah. But I just I want to take a second. And, and again, just what you're doing is really impressive. And I hope a lot of people paid attention to both sides of that, because this is something I think will help a lot of people in, in their uh, in their approaches and in their organizations and such. So this yeah. is a great talk. I, I, I hope a lot of people I hope they fly. I hope you get the same sort of response to the Wheel of Fortune or um, uh, maybe you should just bring that with you and uh, <laughs> set it up. In, in Orlando. Yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 Well, we talk about that also in our talk at um, InfoSec World, mm-hmm. we, we talk um, quite a bit about just kind of, you know, inf- the influencing people and being able to communicate with people better. And mm-hmm. I, again, it's just, and I talk about my, <laughs> about my, my kind of a, original, um, just trying to plan and 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 get started with this job and going from being really excited to really scared and wondering <laughs> if I did the wrong thing because I didn't have an information security background 
And it was a little intimidating. And so I tell that story as well. And then kind of how we went and, you know, I, how I got over that hurdle. And um, so, yeah, there's a little, there's a little drama there. <laughs> there's always a little drama with Tara. <laughs> That's good. So oh, no. let's see. Yeah, we, we want to see that at InfoSec World. So when are you speaking at InfoSec World? Give us a day and time so anybody attending that wants to see the story can hear it. Okay. So I believe it is Monday, April 1st, no. is it? No, I think it's March 29th. <laughs> Don't listen to me. March 30th. Monday, Monday, March 30th. At Monday 4 the 30th. PM. Okay. Monday the 30th at 4 p.m. Okay. Monday, March 30th, 4 p.m. Eastern time, because we are in Orlando. Eastern time. Yeah, we're we're in one that. of the last presentations the on Monday before you can run out to Epcot. Perfect. Exactly. David exactly. and Tara, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on Business Security Weekly. You're we, welcome. Thank yeah, you for having thank us. Thank you for having us. Always a pleasure. And with that, we'll take a quick break and then cover the leadership and communications articles for this week. 